Hello, welcome to the self-learning platform by Dr. Shishma Singh. Today we start Unit 15, Socialist Thought, Ramanohar Loya and Jai Prakash Narayan. And we are going to discuss the socialist thought of Jai Prakash Narayan. Jai Prakash Narayan, popularly known as JP, was a confirmist Marxist in 1929. By the middle of 1940s, he was inclined toward the Gandhian ideology. Till 1952, JP had no faith in non-violence as an instrument of social transformation process. The transformations of the Russian society in the late 1920s had thereafter changed his outlook towards Marxism and the process of dialectical Marx materialism. Soviet Union was no more an ideal model for him, for a socialist society. The bureaucratized dictatorship with the Red Army, secret police and the guns produced an inherent disliking for the Soviet pattern of development. He was convinced that it did not produce decent, fraternal and civilized human beings. He said in 1947, the method of violent revolution and dictatorship might conceivably lead to a socialist democracy. But in only country where it has been tried, it had led to something different, that is to a bureaucratic state in which democracy does not exist. I should like to take a lesson from the history. JP was convinced that there was interrelationship between nature of the revolution and its future impact. He was convinced that any pattern of violent revolution would not lead to the empowerment of people at the grassroots level. He said, a Soviet revolution has two parts, destruction of the old order of society and construction of the new. In a successful violent revolution, success lies in the destruction of the old order from the roots. That indeed is a great achievement, but at that point, something vital happens, which nearly strangles the succeeding process. During the revolution, there is widespread reorganized revolutionary violence when that violence assisted by other factors into which one need not go here has succeeded in destroying the old power structure. It becomes necessary to cry halt to the unorganized mass violence and create out of it an organized means of violence to protect and defend the revolution. Thus a new instrument of power is created and whosoever among the revolutionaries succeeds in capturing this instrument, they and their party or faction become the new rulers. They become the masters of the new state and power passage from the hands of the people to them. There is always struggle for power at the top and heads roll, and blood flows, victory going in the end to the most determined, the most ruthless and best organized. It is not that violent revolutionaries deceive and betray it is just the logic of violence working itself out. It cannot be otherwise. 
जेपी वॉज वेरी मच क्रिटिकल ऑफ डायलेक्टिकल मेटीरियलिज्म ऑन ह्यूमन डेवलपमेंट ही वॉज कन्विंस्ड दैट दिस मैथडोलॉजी वुज इफेक्ट द स्पिरिचुअल डेवलपमेंट ऑफ मैन हिज कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ टोटल रेवल्यूशन इज अ होलिस्टिक वन he used this term total revolution for the first time in the british magazine called the time in 1969 underlying the emphasis on the gandhian concept of non violence and satyagraha he said gandhi's non violence was not just a plea for law and order or a cover for the status quo but a revolutionary philosophy he indeed a philosophy of total revolution because it embraces personal and social ethics and values of life as much as economic political and social institutions and processes the concept of total revolution as anticipated by jp is a confluence of his ideas on seven revolutions that is social economic political cultural ideological and intellectual educational and spiritual jp was not very rigid regarding the number of these revolutions he said the seven revolutions could be grouped as per demands of the social structures in a political system he said for instance the cultural may include the educational and ideological revolutions and if culture is used is an anthropological sense it can embrace all other revolutions he said economic revolution may be split up into industrial agricultural technological revolutions etc similarly intellectual revolution may be split up into two scientific and philosophical even spiritual revolution can be viewed as made of moral and spiritual or it can be looked upon as a part of culture and so on the concept of total revolution became popular in 1974 in the wake of mass movements in gujarat and bihar he was deeply disturbed by the political process of degeneration in the indian politics of the time during his convocation address at the banaras hindu university in 1970 he said politics has however become the greatest question mark of this decade some of the trends are obvious political disintegration is likely to spread selfish splitting of parties rather than their ideological polarization will continue the d evaluation of ideologies may continue frequent change of party loyalties for persona or patriarchal benefits buying and selling of legislatures inner party and discipline opportunistic alliance among parties and instability of governments all these are expected to continue jp was deeply moved by mutilation of democratic process political corruption and fall of moral standards in our public life he said that if this pattern of administrative process continues then there would not be any socialism welfareism government public order justice freedom national unity and in short no nation he said no nationism 
can have any chance. Democratic socialism symbolizes an incent struggle for the establishment of a just casteless social and economic order under a democratic system in which an individual is provided with proper environment. In his address in Patna on 5th June 1974, he said, this is a revolution, a total revolution. This is not a movement merely for the dissolution of the assembly. We have to go far, very far. In a letter to a friend in August 1976, JP defined the character of the total revolution. He wrote, total revolution is a permanent revolution. It will always go on and keep on changing both our personal and social lives. This revolution knows no respite, no halt, certainly not complete halt. Of course, according to the needs of the situation, its forms will change. Its programs will change. Its process will change. At an opportune moment, there may be an upsurge of new forces which will push forward the wheels of change. The soldiers of total revolution must keep certainly busy with their programs to work and wait for such an opportune moment. JP's total revolution involved the developments of peasants, workers, harijans, tribal people, and indeed all weaker sections of the social structure. He was always interested in empowering and strengthening India's democratic system. He wanted the participation of people at all levels of decision making process. He wanted that electoral representatives should be accountable to his electorals and once in five years but if is unsuitable before the expiry of his five-year terms he should be replaced the political representative must be continuously accountable to the public he wanted electoral reforms to be introduced in the political system to check the role of black money in the electoral process of the country he said that some kind of machinery should be established through which there could be a measure of consultation with the setting up of candidates. This machine we should keep a watch on their representatives and demand good and honest performance from them. Regarding the statutory provision for recalling the elected representatives, he said, I do recognize, of course, that it may not be very easy to devise suitable machinery for it and that the right to recall may be occasionally misused. But in a democracy, we do not solve problems by denying to people their basic rights. If constitutional experts apply their minds to the problem, a solution may eventually be found. JP was deeply disturbed by the growth of corruption in the Indian political system. He said, I know politics is not for cents, but politics at least under a democracy must know the limits which it may not cross. 
This was the focal point of JP's People's Charter, which he submitted to the Parliament on 6th March 1975. He said, corruption is eating into the vitals of our political life. It is disturbing development, undermining the administration and making a mockery of all laws and regulations. It eroding people's faith and exhausting their proverbial patience. JP wanted to network of people's committees to be established at the grassroots levels to take care of the problems of the people and the programs for development. He wanted the economic and political power to be combined in the hands of the people. Analyzing his economic program, he said, a Gandhian frame line emphasis on agricultural development, equitable land ownership, the application of appropriate technology to agriculture, such as improved labor, intensive tools and gadgets, the development of domestic and rural industries, and the widest possible spread of small industries. JP's program of Antodia meaning the upliftment of the last man was an essential aspect of his socialist thought. On 21st March 1977, in a statement, he said, Bapu gave us a good yardstick. Whenever you are in doubt in taking a particular decision, remember the face of the poorest man and think how it will affect him. May this yardstick guide all their actions. Right to work was an integral part of his concept of total revolution. He said, once the state accepts this obligation, means will have to be found for providing employment to all. It is not so difficult to do so. JP was also particular about social reforms such as elimination of dory system, development of the conditions of the Harijans, and abolition of the caste system in India's political system. Analyzing his concept of an ideal state, he said in 1977 that the idea of my dream is a community in which every individual every resource is dedicated to serving the weak. A community dedicated to Antodya, to the well-being of the least and the weakest. It is a community in which individuals are valued for their humanity. A community in which the right of every individual to act according to his conscience is recognized and respected by all. In short, my vision is of a free, progressive and Gandhian India. Mino Masani said all through the vicissitude and jigjags of JP's life, there has throughout been a non-violent means for total revolution. JP throughout his career highlighted the role of students and youth in the field of people's movement. He said, revolutions are not brought about by those who are engaged in the race for power and office, whether in the government or in non-official organizations, not also by those who are totally preoccupied with the burden of providing bread to their families, 
and are wary of adopting any risky step the youth of a country alone are free from these constraints they have idealism they have enthusiasm and they have a capacity to make sacrifice from which older men shrink in his letter to youth in august 1976 he said for the long and the endless battle for total revolution there is a need of new leadership the forces of history are with you so go ahead with full confidence victory is certainly yours throughout his life jp has always tried to put men in the center of picture jp said in the society that i have in view for the future men should occupy the central place the organization should be for men and not the other way round but that i mean that the social organization should be such as allows freedom to every individual to develop and grow according to his own inner nature a society which believes in and practices the dignity of man just as a human being now in the end summary of the unit it is often said indian socialist literature did not attain the depth and theoretical maturity like that of planks now or burkin or rosa luxembourg but one must not forget that the significance of indian socialist thought lies in its emphasis on the needs of original socialist thinking in the context of agrarian caste bound underdeveloped economy and polity of india the german marxist considered the peasants as reactionary element the socialist thought in india highlighted the role of peasants in the structural development of the economy the indian socialist were interested in eliminate the prevailing class and caste struggles of indian society they indeed brought about some original thinking on the basic problems of indian society the role of peasants caste struggle and planning in an underdeveloped economy they were for the synthesis of political liberty and economic reconstruction with the emphasis on the gandhian principles of non violence and satyagraha this indeed is their contribution to the indian socialist thought at a time when the growth of excessive authoritarianism of political process and marginalization of majority has coupled with a nexus between native monopolies and the multinational industrial corporations and unethical instruction between local ruling elite and their external counterparts have created a new correlation between economic power and political power there is indeed a need to remember the programs policies ideas methodologies and masses of the indian socialist particularly as founding members of the congress socialist party freedom fighters and socialist theoreticians and political activist dr ram manohar lohia and Chaparkash Narayan played an immortal role in the socialist thought and economic development 
of India. Now we want to wind up this lecture and we have come to the end of the unit. Thank you so much for your attention.